one of the consequences of the the public health crisis, as everybody you know on this uh, Zoom call knows, of course, is that that it has precipitated other crises as well, uh, an economic crisis being uh, a, a very prominent one with devastating consequences, as well as a social crisis. I would say that there is yet another pandemic going on simultaneous, and that is what I have been describing as a pandemic of anxiety. But why is this important to leaders and to sales leaders? Well, it, it's important, I, I think, because anxiety has some very specific effects on the mind, on the way we think. And, uh, and I try to raise awareness about that because it's in part by raising awareness about it that people can actually uh, try to mitigate some of those effects. And uh, one of them, there, there, there are two or three that I'd like to highlight. One is that anxiety uh, affects the way we think. It affects our cognitive uh, abilities and it affects particularly our ability to uh, perceive reality accurately. And if you don't perceive reality accurately, you're not gonna be able to make sound decisions. And, uh, and I think that's particularly important for sales leaders. Uh, I mean, sales leaders need to be firmly rooted in reality, the reality of the world around them, the economic circumstances, the, the way people are changing their buying habits. And, um, and so all those things are, are so important, the ability to perceive reality accurately and to make sound decisions accordingly. Leaders need to be managing their own anxiety reasonably well first before they can then tend to the anxiety levels of those who they are leading. Uh, because if you're not on top of your own, if you're in some kind of maladaptive state, meaning a, a state of panic on one end of the spectrum or a state of abject denial on the other end of the spectrum, um, that's gonna affect you in profound ways and you're, and you're certainly not gonna be a very effective leader. When anxiety focuses the attention so much on the here and now, it, uh, it blocks out, or it can block out our ability to think more into the future. And that is so important for sales leaders to be aware of, because uh, we need to be not only thinking about the short term, but we need to be planning for the future for, for a few reasons. One, of course, there are opportunities in the future, and now is certainly a time to be you know, thinking about that, and there will be opportunities to come. But frankly, on an emotional basis, another reason why I think it's so important for sales leaders to be thinking more future oriented, not just short term, is that frankly, they, uh, the, the people that the sales leaders are leading need to, to have some hope. And one of the best ways to give people hope is by talking about the future, especially if you talk about the future in a way that is rooted in reality, as opposed to kind of spinning tales of, of the future that are not based in reality. But, uh, but that future orientation is an important way of giving hope. One of the kinds of mistakes that people make in, the, in this sort of context that we're talking about under these conditions of, of high anxiety and stress, which is that when you started meeting on, and we're using Zoom, but of course I'm referring to any of these virtual meeting technologies, they're all pretty good. Zoom happens to be my favorite. Uh, but when you start a meeting on Zoom, there is a tendency to do what you do in person, which is to dive right into the agenda of the meeting. And, um, and I think that's a mistake because I, I would recommend that, that leaders take the first few minutes. I'm not talking about you know, diving too much into or taking away too much from the, uh, the agenda. But before you get into the actual business, go around the virtual Zoom room and ask each person to say a word or two, really just a few seconds about how they're doing. Because if you don't, that's a mistake that, that neglects the, 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 the dramatic difference, which is that we're largely working in isolation and having conversations that are technologically mediated rather than conversations that are in person. And just doing that, while it doesn't perfectly replicate the social interactions that take place when we're sitting in a real room together, it does do a little bit along the way of replicating those social connections. And, and I think that as this pandemic goes further, it, those will be even more important. They've been important as far as I'm concerned from the get-go. Secondly, another reason why it's so important is that for, for leaders, you know, the leaders of, a, leaders of a sales team, I, I would assume that they would agree 
that it's really important to know how your salespeople are doing personally. If there's something, there's a problem in their life, if their marriage is struggling or if they are dealing with an illness or economic challenges or a whole host of possibilities that are part of life. Well, um, if you're in the room physically with them, you can kind of read that, read the room much more easily. But now I think you have to be uh, quite a bit more proactive about asking. Now, some people may not want to disclose all that much in the group setting on a Zoom call, but even if you get a hint of that as a sales leader, you can call them up offline afterwards to find out what's going on and check in with them. And it's frankly, it's good leadership to maintain those, those personal connections. One is I do try to take care of myself physically. Um, the, um, I think that's important. Um, I uh, used to be a runner, but uh, as I got past middle age, my, my joints didn't like that too much. And so I became a rower on a rowing machine. I find that, that, that doing that every morning is good, not only physically, but for my sanity. Another thing, and it's again related to what we we're talking about, about meetings, for instance, um, and the lack of in-person contact with our colleagues who are, let's, let's face it, our colleagues are often our friends too. And uh, not to mention our friends outside of work and family members. I, I highly recommend the use of these technologies to try to replicate social interactions, not to just use them for meetings. And uh, it's becoming a little bit trite probably these days, but the idea of Zoom lunches or Zoom cocktails, um, whatever your preference of beverage may be, um, I, I think is a really good idea to do it, even if it feels a little weird initially uh, to have a meal. Uh, you can't exactly pass the fork to have somebody taste the taste what you're eating, but um, to try to replicate social interactions uh, and serendipitous interactions uh, is, is a really good idea. In many ways, we are inventing the best practices as we go here. Uh, there's, there's no handbook on the shelf necessarily that tells us how, how to do it. I think um, it, quite seriously how to deal with some of the mental health challenges. One is to, um, uh, is to make available, uh, in addition to the kind of uh, offerings, wellness related offerings, whether it's meditation or mindfulness, um, or yoga, whatever kinds of health practices people and uh, like, and whatever is sort of part of the culture of an organization, I think those are those are great. Some people will need more than uh, than a basic wellness kind of program can provide, and some people will actually need actually need true mental health care services from psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and so forth. And so uh, it's one of the other reasons why the point I was making earlier, and I should have said this then why it's so important for managers when they're talking to their teams, for instance, on a group call, um, to, to, to ask about how people are doing and to really be observant to try to pick up if somebody is really struggling. Obviously, you don't want to air that in front of the whole team, but if you pick up a little bit and then call the person later and find out how they're doing and it may be that they're really dealing with anxiety or depression, those are probably the two most common kinds of syndromes right now, anxiety and depression whether it's related to the, the, the chronic strain of isolation, if somebody lives alone and has been largely uh, by themselves, or the opposite, uh, which is um, people living in re relatively smaller or cramped quarters with other people and not having uh, much privacy at all. And uh, humans do need you know, some degree of privacy. Or, of course, the very common situation of people who are really dealing with the strain of trying to be good parents at home with young kids and, and, and teach them and just take care of them and play with them, all the things that parents do with kids while also trying to, to maintain a full-time job and be responsible, productive workers. All of that takes an emotional toll. And so um, I think managers uh, should make themselves a bit more vulnerable about their own personal circumstances because that, um, first of all, it's just human and good leadership practice to do that, but it also grants permission to the other people on their teams uh, to open up in, a, in an atmosphere of greater safety themselves. Really critical point. And, um, and, and an extension of that is, um, is if they see that somebody is really struggling, obviously to ask them how they're doing, see if there's something that you can do to help, whether they need some greater accommodation in terms of their work arrangements or what have you, or if they, if it seems like they may need more professional 
uh, clinical help and then to provide an appropriate, uh, whether it's through an EAP or through some other appropriate referral. So, so, some leaders are, are not exactly born, but, but, but develop from early on in life. Others can learn leadership. Some aspects of leadership can also be learned. It's not like you're either born with it or you're not. That's, that would not be a, a fair statement at all. Um, I think I think to talk about values to uh, is an important part of grooming leaders. Uh, a lot of this gets taught in schools. I don't mean business schools. I'm talking about elementary schools. Um, you know, young kids uh, should be exposed to these kinds of ideas. And of course, being a leader in the home with your kids is also where some of these examples get set. Um, you know, it's 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 like the classic story of you know somebody who uh, you know wants their kids to uh, grow up and not smoke cigarettes, right? Um, but if the, if the parents are smoking cigarettes while telling their kids don't smoke, what are the kids learning, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and that's, a, that's sort of a simple, uh, important actually, but a, but a simple example of, what, of the point I'm trying to make, which is that the disparity between what is spoken um, versus what is done. And, um, you know, and, and, and not only kids, but people who work in organizations pay attention to what their leaders do far more than they um, pay attention to what their leaders say. Now, if, if, the, if the two things are the same, if there's consistency between what is said and what's done, that's even more powerful. That these challenging times that we are all living through uh, will be the defining moment for all of us who are in leadership roles in our, in our lives. Uh, we don't know what the future holds, but certainly up to now, this is the, this is the hardest, most complicated time in our lives. And, um, and so it's an opportunity for leaders to shine. Uh, it's, it's difficult, but I, I, think, I think it will be the defining moment in the careers of, of, of many leaders. And uh, so, so I, and I say that not to make people, you know, paranoid and worry about what they're what they're doing, but see it as an opportunity, really. Uh, the, the other thing is, and I, I touched on it before, but I think there are already some silver linings that are emerging from this period, and I think there will be more as, as time goes on. And, and they will vary from person to person. Um, but for instance, uh, ranging from the relatively superficial but not insignificant idea that we can do more virtually and conduct business in a more flexible way than we had previously assumed that may be one on a much deeper level I think that um, that the hardships and complexity of this time is a catalyst for a lot of soul searching about what really matters uh, how do we want to spend our lives how do we want to use the time that we have which is pretty fleeting and um, uh, and, and life is short and fragile and um, so to the extent that we have the luxury of some choices to make, and not everybody does, but those of us who do have some degree of choice in our lives, um, this, uh, this last five months is a, is a stimulus for, for making some really hard choices, but that may ultimately be, 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 be important and good ones.